How's it going, everybody? It's finally time for this month's Lost World video. Now, I know that this one kind of took a little while and I, it's technically not the first video that I put out this month, but as many of you know, I was sick and I actually had the script for the discovery of Dinotoitis already done and I knew that this video was gonna be a big one. So I decided to come out with that first. But that actually worked out because this month the patrons selected New Zealand for the island that we'll be checking out next. This is by far one of the most unique and remarkable ecosystems in the world. And it's the perfect follow-up for last month's video about New Caledonia. Since these two island chains are actually all that's left that's above water from the continent of Zealandia. And the discovery of the giant predatory vulture may have actually had a hand in the rise of one of the most important players in this story. So sit back and relax as we dive into the lost world of New Zealand. The only land on Earth where there's a strong argument to be made that the dinosaurs still ruled well into the Cenozoic era. And as I started to research this topic, one thing started to become very clear to me. And that is that fully documenting the breadth of the avian fauna of this remarkable land in a single video was not just going to be hard, it's going to be a literal impossibility. How do I know this? Well, there are other channels on this very platform who focus largely on this ecosystem. Henry the Paleo Guy is a channel that has had an ongoing series called New Zealand's Bird of the Week. Henry has been releasing this roughly weekly video series for the past four years, covering both extinct and extant birds of New Zealand. And even though this series makes up about two thirds of his video library, He's nowhere near being done. The amount of research and work that he has put into this series is truly impressive. So I wouldn't feel right talking about this subject without giving him a shout out. I'll be focusing on the broad stroke story of these islands as an ecosystem, as it has evolved and changed from its isolation to the eventual arrival of humans and I will talk about many of the most noteworthy creatures here. But if you want to learn even more about the amazing birds of these islands, I'll be leaving links to Henry's channel as well as the full playlist of New Zealand's Bird of the Week in the description. I highly recommend checking it out. To begin this story, we first have to travel back to where we started the last episode in this series to the South Pacific 85 million years ago, when whatever was left of Zealandia at the time was pulling away from Australia and Antarctica. During this time, the world was still dominated by the non-avian dinosaurs. But unfortunately, this is the beginning of the end for any dinosaurs that called this continent home. Because over the millions of years that followed the breakup of Gondwana, the landmass of Zealandia started to disappear beneath the waves. We have a small glimpse of the dinosaurs that called this dying continent home, but it's extremely fragmentary. So much so that even though we can tell what types of dinosaurs lived here, we have yet to be able to name any specific species from this place. For example, we know there was some species of titanosaur here, but whatever this behemoth was, it's only known from a single rib bone. We know that there were ankylosaurs here, but we only know that because of the presence of a set of footprints that match with other ankylosaurs. And we know that there was some species of large theropod, about the size of Allosaurus, but we only know that because of just some fragments as well as a toe bone. So, life on this continent during the Mesozoic is still largely a mystery to science. To get a better idea, the best that we can do is take the small handful of clues and compare it to fauna of another nearby landmass during this time. So, if you compare the fragmentary remains of Zealandia to the more complete specimens that have been found in Australia, you see that there's a lot of potential similarities. Australia had titanosaurs like Australotitan and Savannosaurus, armored dinosaurs like Kumbarasaurus and the Minmi, and even an example of a large theropod with the Megaraptor and Australovenator. So even though we don't have a ton of evidence to go on, we know that the mystery dinosaurs of Zealandia probably had a lot in common with their Australian counterparts. 
But as this land started to separate and drift away, the Zealandian dinosaurs would sadly not get the chance to become island dwarves that we've seen in other examples. Because this island was sinking. In fact, by the end of the Cretaceous, some scientists believe that Zealandia may have completely vanished beneath the waves. A sad fate for the dinosaurs there, but then, I guess it really didn't matter either way. That would have been the end of the story. However, as we get into the Cenozoic era, it was time for the Lost Continent to make a comeback. If there was any part of New Zealand that did manage to stay above sea level this entire time, it would have been parts of the Southern Island. Because this region of the continental plate had been more active volcanically. This led to higher elevations and more land slowly breaking the surface of the water. Throughout the Paleocene and Eocene, these islands probably would have looked something like the Galapagos or the Hawaiian Islands today. But these were the last remaining specks of land from what was once a 5 million square kilometer landmass. And by the end of the Eocene, the North and South Pole were starting to form glaciers for the first time in millions of years. As a result of this, sea levels would drop and more and more land would become exposed. Now there's still a lot that we don't know about early New Zealand. But what we do know is over the 20 or so million years following the end of the Mesozoic, these tiny islands became home to the most basal species of penguin, as well as being the last refuge for a group of very interesting lizard-like reptiles who have been around since the Triassic period. This group is called the Rhynchocephalians. And by the end of the Eocene, as the world was beginning down its long trend towards a cooler, drier climate, the early penguins were probably one of the dominant animals on these islands. As they adapted to their island habitat, they became flightless and started relying on hunting fish under the sea. And they started to do something that many other animals do when affected by an island environment. They got big. The Eocene penguin Pachydiptes grew to around one and a half meters or five feet tall, and Anthropornis got even bigger at almost two meters tall. This penguin weighed over 200 pounds, and as the world continued to get cooler and drier with lower sea levels, the penguins would eventually spread across the southern hemisphere, and especially taking over the glacified continent. But they would never again achieve the great sizes that they did in the Eocene. And as all these changes took place, New Zealand would continue to rise from the ocean, and new animals would come to call this lost continent home. Over the next 15 million years, on every continent, mammals started to evolve to fill the niches that had been previously controlled by some kind of sauropsid for the previous 235 million years. But, there was one place where not only were mammals unable to dominate, they pretty much weren't there at all. Because Zealandia had been purged of life by sinking beneath the waves, by the time parts of it managed to rise back above sea level, its isolation would keep many different animals from establishing themselves at all. It's for this reason that the marsupials who were dominant on nearby Australia never made it here. The animals that would populate this reborn land would be the ones who could fly, and thus, this became the land of the birds. Previously during the Eocene Thermal Maximum, it was thought that much of whatever land was above the ocean was covered in either tropical forests or swamps. But by the time we get to the Miocene, the drying climate had started to make the South Island somewhat similar to the climate that we have today with the rain shadow effect causing rain to be focused on the western edge of the island. But overall, it was probably actually even drier during this time than today, with evidence showing that this island may have been prone to droughts during the summer. But this island was still an avian paradise. Although we don't have a ton of fossil sites from this time, one site on the South Island has yielded a glimpse of what life was like during the Miocene in this land. Birds had probably been pouring into the island as long as there was habitable land to fly to, because that's how birds do. By this time, the first wave of ratites had already arrived, 
and a second independent expansion of them that is closer related to the elephant birds of Madagascar was first setting foot on New Zealand shores. There were gulls, terns, snipes, plovers, petrels, so many different species of seabirds. We have two confirmed species of pigeons described, and the first known species of New Zealand wren, at least two species of herons, one species of eagle, similar to the wedge-tailed eagle of Australia, and the descendants of reptiles that had already been here. The rhynchocephalians were still hanging on, despite having gone extinct everywhere else on Earth. But they had been joined by the true lizards that had taken over on the other remaining bit of Zealandia to the north, the geckos and the skinks. But getting back to the avian fauna, by far the most impressive was a species of parrot named Heracles inexpectus, also known as the Hercules parrot. At almost a meter tall and seven kilograms, this parrot was the largest and heaviest species ever known. At this size and weight, it was probably flightless, but it may have actually been strong enough to use its beak to climb trees as well as smart enough to come up with creative solutions to navigating its world. It was also during this time that the only native group of mammals would eventually make its way to New Zealand, the bats, taking the same strategy as the birds to spread across the South Island and make it their home. But this was still a land of birds for sure, with more and more species arriving as we go forward in time. And this island would start to change every one of them into new species found nowhere else on Earth. As we get closer to the modern day, we come to the climactic roller coaster of the Pliocene and Pleistocene. This caused New Zealand to explode into a staggering range of habitats across the North and South Island. And we see the descendants of creatures like Heracles spread into all these varied environments and take advantage of every corner of this archipelago. And we also see the rise of the largest and most famous group of New Zealand residents. All this, the parrots, the kiwis, the penguins, and even the groups of reptiles that had disappeared everywhere else millions of years ago, owe their existence to these fragments of a forgotten continent. A land devoid of mammals that have truly allowed at least one branch of the dinosaurs to reclaim dominance well into the Cenozoic era. There isn't even much on the way of predators on these islands, which probably had a hand in so many groups independently evolving flightlessness. And actually, as we check out different island environments, we will see this time and time again. Because whenever a new island becomes available for colonization, birds tend to be the first ones to get there. And once they arrive, they're colonizing a new land that is completely devoid of predators. They then take to getting bigger and living on the ground. And all the while, new species would occasionally find their way here. Hey, isn't that one of those little eagles from Australia? Yep, with the larger predatory birds like the wedge-tailed eagle and killer vulture from the last episode, the little eagle adopted a strategy of avoiding them by specializing in smaller prey. But a few started spreading across new surrounding islands like New Guinea and eventually arriving in the southern island of New Zealand. And once they got here, they would find a land that was full of birds, but nothing filling the role of top predator. And that would lead to the little eagle going in a very unexpected direction. But that's a story for another time. That's right, everyone. This one's going to be a two-parter. I didn't even plan for this, but as I dug more and more into everything, there is just so much to talk about with these islands. And as I did that, the more I came to realize that this was, I was going to need to split this one up. And even in doing so, I still have to gloss over some things and just to keep this video from being too long and taking me literally a month plus to edit. Like I said in the beginning, there's a reason why Henry has been able to make a running series going for the past four years just talking specifically about the birds here. So now that we have a good setup for everything, the stage is now set for us to take a look at the lost world that humans only first set eyes on 700 years ago. 
So think of this one as like a history of the Lost World in New Zealand. If you enjoyed this deep dive into the history of the eighth and final continent on Earth, and you want to see more from me, please consider giving this video a like. If not for me, for Little Eagle Foreshadowing.